Sometimes you have to take a break and focus on the things that are really important. In our country and in our culture, uh, historically speaking at least, we tend to work too long, too hard, and too often. Uh, we want to be productive, and that's a great thing. Uh, we talk about historically the country being built on this Protestant work ethic, uh, which is part fantasy, part truth. But we have to, in a sense, get over our self-importance and allow the things that God has designed and the way that God has designed things to happen, to take place. There are things in life that are more important than money. There are things in life that are more important than being productive. And that runs counter to the way that many people in our country are raised. And we have to learn, in a sense, to be refocused on the things that are the most important. And in order to do that, we have to take a break from work and focus on what's really important. Now, I think we should start off by saying that hard work is a good thing. And we emphasize this, I think rightly, that God created mankind for work. And the reason why this gets emphasized is because when we look out in our country, we see, I think again magnified, one of the problems in our society is that some people are not willing to work. Uh, and we go kind of like the opposite extreme, right? The pendulum is either going to be to the right or the left. It's difficult to find that wonderful middle ground where everything works harmoniously. But you see in the beginning that God did indeed create people to work. In fact, God put Adam in the middle of the garden. So he makes all these amazing things uh, for Adam to see. Adam is created, when you read through the creation account, Adam is created out in the wilderness. And then God makes a garden, and God puts the man in the middle of the garden. So Adam saw the wilderness. He's taken out of the wilderness, put in the midst of the garden to work and keep it. Almost like God is saying, Adam, do you see all this craziness? Don't let the garden look like that. So he puts him into this place, and he wants him to tend it. He wants him to work. And so the man is designed to work. And indeed, when you look at your body, and when you look at the way that humans are designed, and, and the drive that we have to go do things, you can see that this is kind of part of who we are. It's what we, what we do. And when somebody doesn't work, when they make the choice, let's say it like this, when somebody makes the choice to not work at all, they lose a little bit of themselves. They lose a little bit of the image that they're made in. And, and so we, we can't say, oh, work is bad. No, work is good. It's a very good thing. And, and in fact, when you look, if you look over in Colossians chapter 3, part of your identity in Christ is this willingness to work for a higher purpose. When you look in Colossians chapter 3, Paul is talking about all these different arrangements that God has put in place, and some that society has put in place. He's going to talk about masters and slaves. That's totally a man-made institution. But God tells us to use these man-made institutions for the purpose of bringing about His glory. So when you look in Colossians chapter 3, it starts off, we'll just read verse 22, bond servants, the word there is slaves. Slaves, obey in everything those who are your earthly masters. Not by way of eye service, as people pleasers, but with sincerity of heart, fearing the Lord. In, in modern business, you have the yes men, right? Or the yes people, I suppose will be politically correct, right? The, the people who always want to be pleasing the boss. They're always yes, always. They're, they're doing this, you know, just to make other people happy. You can kind of tell who they are. Paul says, don't do this just to please other people. But you obey it in everything those who are your earthly masters, so that they can see in you your sincere heart and your fear of God. Then in verse 24, or verse 25, excuse me, then in verse 23, whatever you do, work heartily, as for the Lord, not for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive an inheritance as your reward. You are serving the Lord Christ. We take that and we stop, and we don't look at any other thing. And if you read through that, and that's all you have, you don't have any cultural context, you don't have any historical context, you don't have any biblical context for these statements, it makes it seem like you should be working 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, 
four weeks a month, if we could arrange our months in any kind of sensible order, and every year, right? And so that's kind of what it seems. And so you can understand, I think, why people who want to follow God wind up with this mindset that I have to work all the time. And if I'm not working, I'm wasting my time. Have you ever heard anybody say that? Have you ever felt that? Have you ever not been working and felt guilty? I know, I know people, maybe I'm one of them, who will go and they will work a 12-hour day, and then they will come home and feel guilty for resting for 10 minutes. I wasted my whole day those 10 minutes. Or maybe they'll sleep in one day, and instead of getting up at 4.30 in the morning, they get up at 5 o'clock, and, and they wake up, and maybe you and me would say the same thing. The day's half over. I lost that half hour, my whole day's gone. And we make ourselves feel bad because we weren't working every instant that we were awake. But I want us to see that, that this is good, right? Work is good. We can't, we can't, in our desire to understand what it means to rest, to go too far the other direction. Work is good. God created mankind to work. Work glorifies God. Work shows people your character. They can see in what you do, your sincerity of heart, your desire to serve God, your desire to be productive. These are all very good things. Uh, another thing that we can see when you read throughout the Bible is that it's important if we're going to be talking about work and rest that the Bible never says anything good about lazy people. I can't find one place in the Bible where God says, hey, it's good to be lazy. Not one. In fact, throughout the Proverbs, there's warning after warning after warning against being a slugger, a sloth, against being lazy. And so there's this, this overriding theme that, that everything that God has designed for us to do we ought to try and do it. And everything that we're trying to do, we should do well. And so when we talk about work, this idea of, of, of being, uh, you know, taking it easy all the time is not a biblical concept. And that's important because one of the things that we tell ourselves in this country is that I need to work really hard all the time now so that I can be a sluggard later. That's not a biblical concept either. It, it, laziness is never good. Right, so we, we have to find this balance. We have to find the balance in, in how all of these things work so that we can do things the way that God wants us to. And, and I think one of the, the most important things that shows us that work is a good thing, the very first time you meet God in the Bible, He's working. You meet a God who is at work. Genesis 1 starts off, in the beginning, God made the heavens and the earth. And that's kind of an at-work thing. Right? He's doing that. Genesis chapter 1 and chapter 2 detail all the work that God did in making everything. But it also tells us about this God who rests. And so when we, when we look at this and we, we see that this, I think this is truth. We can read through the Bible and we can see all these things and all of this is true. God created mankind to work, work glorifies God. Being lazy is never good. And God is a worker. But we also have to keep in mind that too much of a good thing is bad. Too much of a good thing is bad. And that's almost universally true. I can't think of a, of a good thing that too much of is not bad. And maybe you can, I can't. Oxygen, do you like oxygen? I love it. Too much oxygen, you catch on fire. You will actually just burst into flames. Thankfully, God designed everything perfectly so that there's enough oxygen in our atmosphere that if you want to start a fire, you can. And if you don't want things to catch on fire, you can usually keep them from doing so. Too much oxygen, bad. Too much water. Do you like water? I love water. Too much water, you die. It's just how it works. This is true with everything. Do you love other people? I love other people. You love other people too much, now you have an idol. So we have to be very careful that we don't go too far with any of the good things that God has given us, including work and including rest, which is also a good thing. And so we have to kind of find how do we balance all of this stuff and how do we find a way that we can do everything that God has called us to do. Work, again, is emphasized sometimes to the point that we feel like we can't ever take a break. We can't ever have leisure time. We can't ever have downtime. And that's, first of all, not God's design. And secondly, it's not healthy either. When we think about this, don't, don't let you make yourself feel guilty, and don't let Satan or culture or other people make you feel guilty for doing what God has designed us to do. 
God has designed human beings to rest. And I heard somebody argue one time, we were talking about resting, and how we need to have downtime, we need to have leisure time. And this guy's response was, I'll work 16 hours a day, and the other eight I'll sleep, that's when I rest. It's like, that's great. You're not a healthy individual. I can tell. You do that all you want. I'm going to stay over here inside God's plan and be healthy. So what we see is that we, we have to get over the fact that you can't do this. Work sometimes, not always. Work can be an overstated thing, an overemphasized thing. And I think the reason, again, why people who want to do what God says do that is because we see the danger and we see the problems that come with not working at all. We don't always see the problems that come with working too much. And so we have to be aware that there's a reason why God designed things the way that he did. Um, when we look at this, there, there are times where there's no rest. Or there are some things that you don't get to rest from. In Luke chapter 2, there's this 12-year-old Jesus who is running around all over Jerusalem, uh, away from his parents, and they're looking for him. And they're like, where did he go? And finally, after three days, they find him in the temple. And depending on the translation that you have, uh, Jesus will tell his parents when they find him, didn't you know I had to be about my father's business? And no matter your translation, the meaning is about the same. The English Standard Version says, didn't you know I had to be in my father's house? It carries the same idea. It's not that Jesus just had to go sit in the temple because that was a special place to sit. It's that Jesus wanted to go and be about what was important to his father. And so we see in Jesus that in a sense, he was working and resting at the same time. He was not working in the field. He was resting from that labor, but he was working for his father. And so even when we rest, it's not like you get a day off from God. That, that's never been the idea. When you look throughout history, in particular Jewish history, they have this six-day work week and they get a seventh day off. That day was meant to free you so that you could focus on God. So that you could focus on the, the important things. And when we rest, we don't get to take a break from God. So, so we don't have work time and I'll focus on God when I'm working. Well, now it's leisure time. I can do whatever I want. That's not the idea here either. So we don't ever get to work, rest from that. In John chapter 9, Jesus would talk about how while it's daytime, you should be working. The darkness is coming, and when the darkness comes, nobody can do the things that God wants them to do. So while you have the opportunity to do what God wants you to do, you should. In James chapter 2, verse 17, we have the writer that says that faith apart from works is dead. So those works should never go away. The good works that God has planned in our life, we're not talking about resting from those things. I don't think we can ever say, well, I've taken care of enough orphans. I'm done with that. I've helped seven widows this month. Not another one. Right? I don't think that you get to say those types of things. But we do need to take time off from other types of work so that we can focus on the things that we need to. Right? When we talk about work that we don't rest from, we're not talking about our work. We're talking about God's work, the works that God has designed for us. But when we're talking about resting, we're talking about resting from the work that we do daily. Right? If you are uh, an architect, resting from drawing buildings. If you are a waste removal technician, resting from riding on the truck. Right? All of the different things that, that we see, resting from that labor so that we can focus on things that are more important. And I think it's important that we see that nowhere in the Bible is work an end in and of itself. And nobody in the Bible works so that they could be working. That's not the picture that's presented in the New Testament. Right? In Ephesians chapter 4, you have the thief who used to steal. In verse 29, it's one of my favorite verses in the whole New Testament. Uh, Let the thief who stole steal no longer, but work with his own hands so that he's working with his own hands. That's not what Paul says. Let him steal no longer, but work with his own hands so that he may have something to share with others who are in need. There's your end. Work with your own hands so you can share. Work with your own hands in Colossians chapter 3 so that you can glorify God. So that people can see your good nature. So that people can see your character. And so while work is what we're doing, work is not the end. We don't work for the sake of work. We do it to bring about other things. Which is why when somebody says, what do you do for a living? The answer should be, 
I serve God. That should be what you do for a living. Nothing else. Because if you say something else, well, what do you do? Oh, I'm a doctor. Now you've made your work the end. And we have to be careful that our identity is not caught up in a job or a title or a position. Our identity is in Christ. You are made a new creature in Christ Jesus, Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5. Our hope is Christ in us. And he'll say in the letter to the Colossians. So work is not an end in itself. As we're going through these things, we have to use God's wisdom to, to balance all of this. I have never in all of the years that I have been sitting by deathbeds had anybody ever say, I wish I'd worked longer hours. I wish I had another week of life so that I could put in another 90 hour work week. I've never heard that. Not once. I have sat by people who were dying who did that their whole life. And they regret it. They look back and they say, I wish I had spent more time doing this. I wish I had spent more time doing this. And actually, surprisingly, one of the things that you hear more of, most often as people are dying is, I wish God had been more important in my life. It's sad that it takes that to find that out. But at least they found it out. And so we have to be careful that we use God's wisdom. And when you go over to the, to the book uh, of Ecclesiastes, let's turn over there for just a second. I, I like Ecclesiastes, and I hate Ecclesiastes. Uh, it's a double-edged sword, right? <laughs> because it goes through and it talks about all these wonderful things, and it talks about all these things that we put our pride in, these things that we like and we love, and it says, by the way, they're all foolish. All of these things, they're silly. And so you get over to Ecclesiastes chapter 2, and we talk about work, and we take pride in our work, and we want to do a good job, and, and we want to make sure that, that we're, we're, we're working hard. And when you look at what the wisdom is concerning that, it says, I considered all that my hands have done, and the toil I had expended in doing it, and behold, it was vanity, and a striving after wind, and there was nothing to be gained under the sun. If you put your identity in what you do, if you find your value in what you do, then your value is foolishness. Your value is vanity. Which doesn't mean pretty. Right? It means worthless. And so God's wisdom is that, yeah, work is a good thing, but work isn't the end. Work isn't what you're after. And there's something more important than work. And when you look in verse 24 of the same chapter, you keep reading, it says there is nothing better for a person than that he should eat and drink and find enjoyment in his toil. Now I'm going to quibble a little bit with the preposition here. He should find enjoyment by his toil. Uh, if, we, if we just look over in verse 11 and it says that work is striving after wind, then why would you find pleasure in vanity? I don't. I do find pleasure in things that are worthwhile. I do find pleasure in things that are lasting. And what we see when you're looking through this, it says in verse 24, there's nothing better than a person should eat and drink and find enjoyment in his toil. Well, no, that doesn't match with eating and drinking. When you hear eating and drinking, what do you think of? Party should be the word, right? Now, Christians are supposed to go party. No, those are bad. Now, actually, God commands the Hebrews to party. God, God describes heaven as a party. Now, not the crazy, wild thing that you see on television that society calls parties, but festal gatherings, feasts, convocations, gathering together in joyous celebration. That's kind of what I think of when I hear eating and drinking, and you work so that you can get to that. Right? That's the end. God created the garden not so that Adam could waste away his life working, but so that Adam would have something to do to bring about good that he could enjoy. Sometimes I think we forget that God made the world for us to enjoy. God made fruit taste good because you have a mouth that really likes things that taste good. So you go and you tend an orchard to get the fruit so you can enjoy it. You find enjoyment by your toil. And that whole process brings glory to God. God worked for six days and rested. And Jesus would look at that and say, man wasn't made for the Sabbath, but Sabbath for man. The, the seventh day of the week doesn't need us. We need it. 
We need rest. We need enjoyment. We need pleasure. And God made the world full of wonderful, pleasurable things to be enjoyed the right way. In fact, he would tell the Hebrews that you have to take a day off. You have to take a day off once a week to focus on the things that are important. And when we think about this, God is our model, right? We are in the image of God. We, we don't necessarily look like Him. I don't think God has ten fingers and ten toes. But we are made like God. All of the emotions that we have, all of the ways that we live, all the, the, the things that we desire, the, the, the inner parts of who we are, that's like God. And when you meet God again at the beginning, He works. And then He rests. And both of those, in my mind, are conundrums. Why does God take six whole days to make the universe? I don't know. He could have done it instantly. But he took six days. And then after he takes six days, he rests for a day. Why do, was he tired? Was he, did, was he worn out? Making the universe was just really hard for God. No. I don't understand either one of those things unless God is showing us this is what you need. You need to have a goal. You need to have something that you're doing to bring about a time when you can rest. And that's kind of what you see. And you see Jesus doing that. Jesus would take time to spend by himself. Jesus would take time to spend with other people. He would call his disciples away privately and he would spend time with just them. Jesus would go off by himself and pray. In a sense, Jesus is taking a break from his work to kind of recharge. He never takes a break from God. He never takes a break from doing spiritual things. In fact, when his disciples come to him privately, very often those are spiritual learning sessions. There's never a break from that. But there is a break from walking around all over Judea. There is a break from carpentry work. There is a break from fishing. All these things that these people were doing. So this is important. It's necessary that we see this. And I think there also, there's also spiritual significance to the day of rest, too. That's not really the focus of what we're talking about this morning. But you can find that over in Hebrews chapter 4. There is no particular day of the week that Christians rest. Because our Sabbath is heaven. That is the Christian's Sabbath rest. And the argument in the book of the Hebrews is that if, if, if they have really been given rest by Moses... If the Sabbath was the rest of God, then they would never, there would never be another rest mentioned. But since there is, the physical rest here on earth is not really what we're after. We're after that spiritual rest where we enter into God's presence. What we see in all of this is I think God who designed us knows us best. We tend to think, well, I can, I can focus on people while I'm working. While I'm working, you can't. The, the, the human multitasker is a myth. Psychologically speaking, humans cannot multitask. You can focus on one thing at a time. Now you can focus on this for 30 seconds, and that for 30 seconds, and that for 30 seconds, but you cannot focus on all three for 30 seconds. Nobody can do that. It's just not how our brain works. So you cannot be focused on work and your family at the same time. While you're working, you should be focused on work. If I was an employer and you showed up to work and you were thinking about your vacation the whole time you were at work, I would just ask you not to come back. Likewise, if I owned a resort and you came to my resort and you were working the whole time, I would probably ask you to leave. You're bothering the other guests. I don't know if I would do that. I'd probably just keep your money. But we have to be careful that we don't get all this stuff messed up, mixed up. And we have to be careful that we don't buy the excuses that Satan peddles to undo this pattern that God has put in place. Right? We will say things like, well, I have to provide for my family. And yeah, there are some extreme cases where maybe you do have to work more often than you should because of whatever. Right? And we're not talking about that. But sometimes we have enough. But we keep working because we have taken this provide for my family thing to mean that everybody in my family has to drive a Porsche. And when you put the uh on the end of Porsche, it becomes much more valuable. Everybody in my family has to have a Ming vase. Same thing. Vase, much more valuable than a vase. Right? We, we start defining things in such a way that providing for our family leaves the realm of what that passage in 1 Timothy 5 actually means. 
In fact, that passage in 1 Timothy 5, the word provide there, actually means to consider. It's almost a spend time with word. So really what your family needs is, yeah, do they need to eat? Sure. Do they need to have clothes? Generally a good thing. But they need you. They need you. In 1 Timothy chapter 5. People use the standard of living as an excuse to work longer hours. Well, everybody in the United States has two or three cars, and if you have multiple children, you need at least one car per kid. And then you need to have at least one bedroom for every kid. Every kid deserves their own room, don't they? And then you need to have, you know, a big yard so they can go out and play in the yard. And we keep coming up with all these things that we need and all these things that we have to meet to the point where you wind up with four, four mortgages, seven million dollars in auto loans, and a house that has, in my case, 11 rooms. Bedrooms. That's just ridiculous. Ten. Ten? Ten. Ten bedrooms. <laughs> Who needs a house with that many bedrooms? The military can house 500 soldiers in one room. We can have ten in one room in mine, if necessary. Right, so don't, don't buy these things. And, and it ultimately comes down to... Are we, are we residents here? Is our citizenship here? Or is our citizenship in heaven? And the answer to that question frees us from being stuck in the grind here. We should work. Work is a good thing. We should use work in order to bring God glory, in order to have things to share, in order to provide for our families, all of these good things that we've talked about. But we can't let that override or overpower the things that God says about rest. It's so important to find this balance. Not just because you'll be healthy. In fact, I think that's actually secondary. But because this brings the most glory to God. And it fulfills the needs that He designed us to have. We're out of time. Uh, thank you for your attention. Uh, we'll be dismissed to classes.